So good morning, everyone. I want to thank you so much for coming to our Food Policy for Breakfast Seminar Series. I want to welcome you to Hunter College and uh, New York City Food Policy Center's first webinar. My name is Charles Plackett. I'm the director of the center. And again, I'm not going to speak too much about this, but this is these are very strange and difficult times, and I'm glad that many of you were able to make time for this important discussion um, about you know, food, hunger, and uh, the coronavirus. Um, we're very fortunate to have several experts uh, to take time out of their busy schedule to talk about the impact of the outbreak on our food system. Uh, Joel Berg, CEO of Hunger Free America, Commissioner Grace Manella, Human Resources Administration, Michael Hurwitz, uh, Director of Green Market, Go NYC, Kate McKenzie, um, Director of the New York City uh, Mayor's Office of Food Policy, Brian Moran, Director DevOps of City Harvest and founder of Plentiful, and Karen Washington, owner uh, Rise and Root Farmer. Um, and also we're joined with Alexina Cather, who's a deputy director of the Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center. Um, so thank you again for, for joining and for being part of this. Um, before I have everyone introduce themselves, I wanted to let you know about a project uh, the center is working on. Um, I think that Melissa is going to pull it up on the screen for anybody that would like to see it. Uh, and there she goes on cue. Um, this is called Coronavirus New York City Neighborhood Food Resource Guides. Um, the center has created a series of Coronavirus New York City Neighborhood Food Resource Guides to help connect community members in need with food resources. Each of the 59 New York City Food Resource Guides, so we, have 50, we will have 59 of them. What we tried to do was do triage and only get to the communities um, uh, that we believe are underserved. Uh, we have volunteers and paid callers that are going to update these weekly. We really want to try to get it to every two days. Um, and it has food pantries and soup kitchens, farmers markets, grocery stores uh, with store hours and delivery options, meals for children, and the distribution site for seniors and distribution sites, home delivery, service, services for those with disabilities, shelters and services for the homeless, resources for immigrants and undocumented individuals and families, nonprofit organizations offering food delivery and SNAP and WIC resources. And we also you know, went through this and um, added that, um, you know, whether you need ID cards, we really tried to do the best we could with the limited resources to get these out right away. And they've been out for almost a week now. Um, and we're also starting to develop these volunteer call banks. Um, we started working with partners to help um, refresh this data, including Share Meals, Plentiful, and Joel doesn't know it yet, but Hunger Free America. And um, Great. <laughs> <laughs> he is definitely going to help. And uh, we welcome any and all partners because, again, you know, we're not trying to take credit for this. What we really want to do is participate, but, you know, keeping the uh, shelter in place rules and, uh, for, for our staff and try to make a huge impact. And we hope that we're doing that. Um, so thank you. And Melissa, you could take the screen down and we'll make sure that everybody has access to this. Um, so if we could just start briefly uh, with having you just uh, introduce yourself. I know I did, but if, if each person can say a word or two about uh, what they're doing and, and their name, that would be fantastic. Starting with Joel. Hi, I'm Joel Berg. I'm CEO of Hunger Free America. Some of you may still know us under our old name, New York City Coalition Against Hunger. We're based here in New York City, but we work nationwide now on policy and direct service. And the main point we want to get out to the public is this is a massive crisis built on top of a pre-existing crisis. That in 2018, 1 million New Yorkers and 37 million Americans lived in households that can't afford enough food. And so our top point is we need to maximize the federal nutrition assistance programs and then figure out door-to-door uh, -door food distribution. But our single-minded focus to get the word out what people aren't hearing is that we really need to make sure people can get the programs that exist already and the new programs that I'm sure we'll discuss today, like the new pandemic EBT program. Okay. Um, Commissioner? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Grace Bonilla. I'm the administrator for the Human Resources Administration. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with our agency, we serve over 3 million New Yorkers uh, in 12 different programs across that are fighting poverty. Currently, the crisis has really put a stressor on two of our programs, Cash Assistance and SNAP, which I'm happy to talk about. 
uh, how we're doing as this conversation continues. Uh, but as a good city employee, I have to stress the importance of making sure that we are using our online resources to access these benefits so that we can promote social distancing, both for our clients and our staff. Uh, and again, thank you for having me. Great. Um, Michael? Good morning. Uh, Michael Hurwitz. I'm actually, my new title is the uh, Food Access and Agriculture Director at Grow NYC. And under those programs, um, we have farmers markets that are up and running. We have food boxes and farm stands, again, up and running. Uh, these are deemed essential services. Our wholesale arm is out there, trucks on the road. Uh, and we're just, we're constantly figuring out new models to safely get food to as many people as possible. And that's what we'll talk about today. Thanks for having me here. Kate? Hi, good morning. I'm Kate McKenzie, the director of the Mayor's Office of Food Policy. Um, I am part of the um, Food Czar team that is working for our COVID food, um, food responses, um, particularly on two streams. One is ensuring uh, that New Yorkers are fed in um, ways that are appropriate, whether they're socially isolating, whether they're socially distancing, um, as well as ensuring that we have a very robust and, um, and fluid food supply stream. Um, we're working directly with uh, Commissioner Garcia. Many of you have heard her um, over the past week and will continue to do so. And we've got a really robust team. I'm working on the high level strategy and execution of those strategies across the different work streams. Um, and uh, you'll be hearing much more, certainly on this call, but in the coming days um, uh, this week. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and Brian? Brian. Oh, sorry, I unmute myself there. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brian. I'm excited to be here. I'm director of DevOps for Plentiful, which is a software project a collaboration between United Way of New York City and City Harvest. Um, I'm recently in addition to the City Harvest team now, but I've been working on Plentiful since it's launched three years ago. Uh, Plentiful is a food pantry reservation system and management system. So all the pantries on the system are using it day in, day out. And we're right now just trying to keep our scheduled data as up to date as possible and relaying information to our partner agencies. Uh, really suggest, I think one of the biggest problems we're having currently is just dynamic data and how quickly things are changing on the ground and making sure that people are getting the most updated information possible. And I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. And Karen? Yes, my name is Karen Washington. So I'm a farmer and an activist. Um, I'm co-owner of Rising Farm up in Chester, New York. I'm also a community gardener and I live in the Bronx. And so these are definitely um, undaunting times living here in the Bronx at 62 counties in New York State. The Bronx ranks 62 as the most unhealthiest borough uh, county. And um, what I'm doing is that I'm partnering with uh, Soul Fire Farm, Black Farmer Fund, and also NEFOC. We have a Skillshare call every Sunday to talk about some of the issues that are affecting mostly BIPOC communities of color across the country. Thank you. So let's, let's get right into the questions. Thank you. Um, and uh, look, we, we realize that, you know, the current coronavirus with stay at home policies in place um, differs from other emergencies that New York City and other communities have had around the country. Um, but New York City is faced with feeding its food insecure and hungry. What are some of our new challenges um, and how are we dealing with them? What are we doing right and what are we doing that we can improve? Um, and I would just want to open that up to, to anybody, anyone on the panel. So I'm happy to start. Um, I think the biggest challenge, which is very different from what we saw, for example, in Sandy, is that we don't have a, po a, a population that's already identified that needs assistance, right? The population keeps growing. The rate of growth from neighborhood to neighborhood is different. And uh, I, speaking for an agency that has to operationalize um, the making sure that we're needing the, the, the needs of so many people as they're losing their jobs, and that also is a moving target, Keeping staff safe and keeping clients safe, I think, has been the biggest challenge. Uh, we are moving as quickly as we can uh, to make sure that clients don't have to come in. Uh, just 
it's amazing. Things that we wanted to do for years have happened within weeks. Uh, many of you know, because you are part of the food world, uh, that SNAP has been available online for many years uh, at HRA, but cash wasn't. And the fact that we made, we just like turned this entire enterprise of cash assistance and TANF to be available online uh, so that people don't have to come in. It's amazing, but it comes with its own challenges. Um, and right now, just making sure that we're keeping our essential workforce coming in, meeting the needs of New Yorkers and keeping their families safe has been one of the largest challenges. Um, I'll, I'll jump off from that. Um, thanks, Grace. You know, um, Brian, you named it also the the absolutely um, fluid state of of the of everything, right? Of the numbers of um, people that we need to feed, of the um, you know trucks that are on the road, everything changes by the hour, um, and so trying to you know it's you know solve for something that then to to you know the next day needs to be solved for again. I would say you know we certainly. Um, we certainly were thinking about this, you know, it feels like a year ago, it was really two weeks ago when we um, started to really understand the massive need for home delivered meals. Um, and, you know, I'm particularly, um, I think it was a terrific solution to partner with the Taxi and Limousine Commission, who otherwise these drivers would not be working. Um, so to really put, um, put a workforce back to work that otherwise wouldn't um, in an effort to do home delivered meals, um, was a, a, an obvious sort of win-win. I will say also that, you know, um, to Grace's point, um, how we identify solutions for an unknown target population is mind boggling. Um, you know, we are, as I said, in the coming days, we'll be rolling this out more, um, but thinking about, um, you know, certainly the supply of meals, um, you know, I wanna underscore everyone should know that currently we are not at all concerned about the supply of food coming into this city. Um, we are tracking that um, in, intensely, um, but also very aware of the workforce supports needed um, for vulnerabilities in staffing along all measures, all um, you know, parts of the food supply. Kate, can, um, I just, can I just ask you, how are you tracking? Um, yeah, so, so it's part of the food And, parts, and one yeah. point on top of that is, how are you tracking it? And I guess, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are concerned for the for the food insecure and the hungry, and also for everybody else out there. You know, as workers and truck truckers and you know food delivery people start to come down with the virus um, or are asymptomatic and are potentially spreading it, yeah. um, it scares me, and it scares me that the workforce will disappear or go on strike or not want to be vulnerable to the situation. Yeah. So, are sure. we are we thinking about that? Yeah. yeah so we, yeah, um, we are. Um, I will also say that um, as part of the Food Czar team, specifically in the food supply work stream, we've, um, we're the, uh, Lindsey Green um, from the Economic Development Corporation, together with about at least 10 to 15 of EDC staff and additional, you know, sort of, um, we've got uh, the Department for City Planning has a division of regional planning. Um, we have, um, through our Office of Emergency Management, um, uh, Ira Tannenbaum with public-private partnerships. We've got, you know, our, our uh, fingers on the pulse of a number of different metrics that we're looking at twice a day to get at um, sort of food supply indicators that we uh, monitor every day. I also want to pull it in really more closely also to the emergency food network and the emergency food system. So there's food getting into the city, but then of course spreading it um, out um, across um, all different access points. And so, you know, together with many of the people that are probably on this call, along with the representation, you know, um, on the panel, really trying to, um, to do the best that we possibly can around situational awareness of food going to emergency food providers, both through the city's emergency food assistance program, but certainly through the incredibly robust emergency food network of City Harvest, United Way, Food Bank, um, and, and more. Um, so really trying to uh, monitor and, and be aware of any food needs that are coming in and solving for those. So it's at two levels, right? It's food moving um, to the emergency food system, to certainly the grocery store, certainly absolutely to the farmer's markets, um, as well as just overall supplies coming into Hunts Point and many, many other areas as well. And, and are, are these 
workers that are working in Hunts Point and working in, um, in, in volunteer situations, are they being given, you know, masks? And I mean, as of last night, they started saying, well, you know, because of the asymptomatic uh, aspects of COVID-19 that, you know, wearing a masks and, and um, well, gloves, we know there's trickiness too but certainly yeah. having access to gels yeah. and things like that. We, yeah. We're, yeah, we're certainly aware of all of the, the um, asks, the needs and the resources for PPE, specifically to Hunts Point and other areas um, and are, are solving for that um, as we speak. Right, but, and, and, and Joel um, and, and Michael as well, what about Green Market and what about, what do you hear about um, uh, food, pantry volunteers and workers and are they scared and certainly farmers coming to green markets and Karen you're you know out in the field you hear from farmers so you know I kind of opened that up and Alexina you wanted to jump in on top of that correct? Yeah I, I wanted to see what's being done to protect the farmers and I know Michael you guys have been doing taking a ton of precautions at farmers markets with social distancing uh, I just want to take it one step behind even the food workers and the delivery workers and see what's going at the start of the food supply chain. So we try to get ahead of the curve. We're trying to, to turn off the chat, everyone. Thank you. Um, wow. Uh, unbelievable. What was uh, that? Uh, please, the trolls, the troll, please turn off the chat because it's very offensive to me what I'm seeing. Some trolls have in, invaded our chat, so the chat needs to be turned off. Please. Yeah, we're, we're doing that right now. See, I mean, I, I need to step in here because, again, I'm going to be the voice of the underserved because this is hitting home to so many of people before this had happened that were not being fed properly not being treated properly. And so they're scared. They're scared. People are scared. These are the people that are going to the front lines, the grocery store workers, the people who are in the fields, the people that are putting their line, the Uber drivers, the people that have to come home because they live in housing where they have their parents, the grandparents and children. People are scared. There is a relief, this sort of ideological relief that we're going to get $1,200, money's going to come Within a, within a couple of weeks, but what happens after that? This has been a problem that has been brewing before this virus, and what this virus has done is br brought everything to the surface. The fact that we've spent so much time on materialistic things, economic things, when we didn't focus on food, we didn't focus on food in a way of not being in terms of subsidizing food, but in a way of making sure that people have the economic status and power to control their food system, to be able to to, to work so that they could feed their families. So now how do we go beyond this? Because we cannot repeat the, the system. The system is broken. This is a new day. And so we have to look at how we're going to move forward, not only in the immediate future, the immediate time now when we're concentrating on feeding food now, getting people food pantries, soup kitchens, all well and good. But one, two, three months from now, where, where's the food system going to be so that these people who have been marginalized for so long have hope. And right now, they don't see hope. They see what has happened immediately because it's only within a few weeks. But come June, July, August, I feel that my people are going to be in the front lines of, of suffering. That's number one. And it's going to panic. It's going to be panic. If you, if you look at the grocery stores now, it's going to be pure panic when people cannot feed themselves. They cannot pay their rent. It's going to be panic. So the conversation needs to be talking about now, but we also need to talk what's going to happen a couple of months from now in vulnerable communities that are going to just go crazy. I want to agree with Karen that uh, what's happened now as what happened after Katrina and Sandy is these crises rip the bandages off the festering wounds that were poverty and structural racism and inequality and hunger beforehand. And this extra crisis really forces the rest of the nation to see this. I do want to echo a little bit of relatively good news when Commissioner Bonilla said that uh, I will say that it is true we are actually more advanced than 
virtually anywhere else in the country in terms of online applications for SNAP. Uh, New York City was the first place you could submit not only your application, but your documents by smartphone and also submit your documentation by smartphone. Uh, some people think that low income people don't have smartphones, but at least three quarters of the caseload of HRA, I understand, do, and that's probably uh, more now. And the fact that we quickly moved to being able to do, we, meaning the city, quickly moved to be doing cash assistance uh, is huge. Uh, it is something that normally would take a government agency a year or two to plan. And the fact that they did it in a few weeks really is amazing. And I hope we learn from this that let's change the federal regulations and the requirements so after this, everyone can apply online. This idea that we prevented people from applying for cash and, you know, online because we all think they're crooks. I'm not saying the city, but the national policy, we're going to prove there's no increase in fraud if, God forbid, you make it easier for people to get food help. So that's the good news. The bad news is I don't know that most people outside of a few people working on this understood the stakes involved. What would happen when New York City public schools closed and nearly a million meals a day weren't being served? Uh, I won't weigh into whether the mayor was right or wrong to close the schools or timings. I'm not an epidemiologist, but I did push back against conserves who are poo-pooing you know, the food challenges that the mayor was raising. One conservative said, oh, what's the big deal? Get a few pickup trucks. I answered, well, you know, Meals on Wheels, one Meals on Wheels told me they deliver 50 meals a day uh, you know, with their trucks. Let's say through a pickup truck, you're able to deliver, you know, somehow miraculously 500 well, to deliver uh, you know, uh, a million meals a day with tr trucks serving 500 a day, you would need 2,000 pickup trucks and 2,000 drivers. So I don't know that anyone really outside of a handful of people like Cade and DOE working on it were really focused weeks ago on what the stakes would be and how challenging this would be. And we know over the summer, 85% of the kids don't get school uh, summer meals at feeding sites. So why should we be shocked that a very small percentage are going uh, to those sites to pick up meals during the school year when you add on top of that a pandemic? And the last thing I'll say, and those of you who know my long-term message is that soup kitchens and food pantries and food banks and food rescue groups are wonderful to fill in the gaps for now, but they cannot and should not be the long-term answer to hunger. Even before this crisis, the federal nutrition assistance programs provided more than 20 times or at least 10 times the amount of food by dollar amount that every charity in America gave out. And we say, oh, well, there are a lot of these in New York City. They're between 800 to 1,000. Well, that is a lot, but there are 8,000 retail establishments in New York City that accept SNAP. And the retail establishments even now are far more likely to be open far more hours than soup kitchens or food pantries. Uh, and that's why our message is, yes, city and state government and federal government should provide more money through food banks and soup kitchens and food pantries through programs like the federal TFAT program through the state TIP. Uh, a HIPNAP program through the city EFAP program, but we're really pushing Congress and the state legislature and uh, the city council to also provide money for benefits outreach. As great a job as HRA is doing, they are going to be swamped. Uh, we and many other nonprofit groups have people who speak Mandarin and Cantonese and Spanish and Polish, and we're going to need massive nonprofit help to have people access these benefits. And let's look at the bigger picture. That is by far the most cost efficient and properly done the quickest way to get mass amounts of food to hungry people. The new pandemic EBT program uh, right now, if USDA approves the state plan, is going to get over $800 million dollars into the shopping carts of low income people over a, a, a few months. And so let's keep our eyes also, not only charitable food distribution, but the things that will get the most food to the most people most quickly. So I have to underscore Joel's point here. Uh, the best way for us to really get food out to people is through the SNAP program. We are already seeing our um, EFAP program going through a number of stressors. I'm happy to report that where EFAP is concerned, we haven't seen uh, many places closing or running out of food, but the, we, we are, uh, while a large part of the program, we're not the only answer to the program. There are over 800 pantries. We are seeing that some of them are running out of food. We're seeing that volunteers are not showing up. Uh, so to just depend or just have a conversation around emergency food, I, I agree with Joel, is a mistake. Um, Karen, to your point, the inequities in our systems are definitely showing up. Uh, one of the things that we cannot get our eye off the ball on is that before this pandemic, this federal government was on the attack where SNAP was concerned. We had ABUD rules that were going into place. We had categorical eligibility looming. While all of that is paused, 
right now because of her pandemic, I really fear what would have happened if those things had gone into effect before this pandemic took place. So we really need to support the type of advocacy that Joel is talking about and ensure that these benefits are there for New Yorkers, not just at a time of crisis, but as an equalizer to poverty. Okay, well, also mentioned the WIC program, which is not an entitlement that does run out of money, but Congress just did give it $500 million, and uh, that doesn't go through the city, it goes through the state and nonprofits. We need to work on that. Grace, can I just ask you, are you able to say how many new people applied for SNAP in the last two weeks as opposed to two weeks, two months ago? Do you have sure. that? Can you tell us? So I can give you one indicator because we're tracking this on a daily basis. Normally, on any given day, we would get about 6,000 applications we got about 16,000 in one day, right? So that, and that is at the beginning of the crisis. Um, nonetheless, we are trying as hard as we can to make sure that as many of our folks are working from home so that we can keep them safe, but that they're able to process the unprecedented number of applications that we're getting. Uh, switching slightly, sorry, so thank you. Uh, Michael, what's going on with the farmers and, and you know, what's going on with the markets? Um, are, are the farmers concerned? Are they, you know, are they getting the virus? What's, go, what's happening? Um, I think everyone obviously is concerned and I think everyone is, is looking for guidance. Our markets, our wholesale arms, our lifelines to our region's farmers. Um, and the fact that we were deemed essential was vital to, to their survival. Um, and really to getting the healthiest food to spread throughout New York City. Uh, one thing I, I do want to talk about is, you know, between SNAP and emergency feeding and, and WIC, these are vital purchase supports for communities. But it starts with a food system that is extractive, that prioritizes corporate profits, and that does not build resiliency. And so there have been record profits for a consolidated set of food corporations, while farmers have gone, more and more farms go out of business every day in our state and in our country. And I think something like this screams out loud how vulnerable a system like that makes all of us, and that resilient food systems are, are truly essential. You know, we put protections into place starting a month, about a month ago, to protect customers, to protect our staff, protect our farmers. And I'll tell you across the board, all of us are out there on the front line serving, doing these services. And it, 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 I, we would be nothing without our team, our market managers that are out there every day, our food box coordinators and our, our volunteers, our drivers. Michael, what protections are you put, what did you put in place for your, for your staff? Early on, we made it so that customers could not handle the food. We were limiting contact as much as possible. We were reforming our uh, farmer's tents so that we would actually physically space the food so that uh, to uh, make it harder for, for customers to touch since it was, it, you know, going to a farmer's market and being able to be present and feel and the, the social component is such a huge, huge part of it. And so we had to change almost overnight, change customers' behavior patterns. Um, the more messaging that came with, 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 with the governor and the mayor, messaging around separation, we supported that as weeks went on, but early on it was farmers must wear gloves, customers can't touch, spacing of, spacing of the farmer's tents three to four feet, that's now 10 feet. Uh, the city has been incredible working with us, Commissioner Garcia, the food czar, Kate, her team, uh, Parks Department in allowing us to spread out. Um, changing our permits so that we can take as much space as possible to ensure that our, our farmers can be there, that we can operate a safe operation. Um, our, our, our market managers are out there day in, day out, spacing out six feet lines to show people. People will do, just be, everyone wants guidance. Like one of the things that we've noticed is if, if, if information is out there, people will, will swallow it up. and, and our, our phenomenal neighbors, New Yorkers are, are incredible in times like this. Um, and if you provide the information, they'll do exactly what they're, they're yearning for. So if we mark out six foot spaces and, and we've seen it um, throughout our markets, throughout our, our food access sites. Now, some of our sites have closed. 
um, due to some foot traffic and some of our uh, um, box sites were indoor and they were workplace. That's allowed us to, to uh, reshift some, some of our, our programs. Um, some of our funders also have been incredibly flexible in allowing us to shift so that we can maximize getting as much food to the places that we need. That's on the philanthropic community. That's from our city, city money, the USDA allowed us to take some money that was designated for travel and to use it to pay for hand sanitizers in, in markets. Um, it's really a, everyone's been incredibly supportive. And as Kate said, we're learning this one day at a time, one week at a time, or some of it we're making it up as we go along, other we're being as prepared as we possibly can. And one of the things going back that makes this so unique to others, you don't know what staff you're gonna have available or what volunteers you're gonna have available day to day. And so that scramble has been incredibly challenging. Um, at Grow NYC, we've shifted other program staff, our, our zero waste staff, again, with the, uh, Commissioner Garcia said it's all about food access right now, and it's on. So all of our compost staff is allowed to be working on food access programming to maximize as much staff as we can to create as many food access points as possible in the city. I just want to also chime in. Um, uh, in some of the other networks that I'm a part of um, are asking for some of the guidance, are asking for some of the um, innovations, particularly from GROW um, that they've done, um, and which is tremendous. No other city to my knowledge has created such a robust platform um, of, of how to operate markets in these times, because, you know, um, again, from the city perspective, this is about also mitigating against supermarket congestion. Um, we really want to create as many market opportunities as possible. So um, I've shared out the GROW guidance um, to the U.S. Conference of Mayors Network and others, particularly LA is interested in, um, in implementing the, um, the structures that GROW NYC has, has started. Michael, have, you, has, have the farmers actually seen an, uh, a huge increase in sales? Because I mean, I know the supermarkets have. Uh, some did. Uh, three, two and three weekends ago, and two, two and three weeks ago, some of our farmers were seeing record sales. Um, our protein farmers, fish, bread, legumes and grains. Kate McKenzie is going to get so sick of hearing me say legumes and grains because four weeks ago it was about climate change, carbon farming, farm resiliency, food system, school foods, procurement, grains and legumes. And now it's about grains and legumes getting us through a pandemic. Um, it's what every culture has traditional to its, its cuisine is cooked differently with different spices um, and, and truly is, is what can sustain us. We have seen a slowdown over the past couple weeks since shelter in place has gone in, but our markets are robust. Um, you know, in peak season, there are over 12,000 individual varieties. We are helping um, onboard some of our farmers to be able to pre-order uh, we're about to publish some where others can can order um, pre-order through their own some of our farmers websites again try to create as little touch as possible and as convenient as possible um, our farmers listen we are um, also ensuring that no that folks who are coming to work are coming to work are able to come to work and are safe coming to work I just jump in a second because I was to give a little picture of what's happening on our farm at Riser Roof Farm. So we're up in Chester, New York. We have three acres. And so we have four people working and we have one person that's part time. And so we had to develop, first of all, safe distancing that we've done on our farm. That's number one. And because I'm the eldest, I'm 65. Now I can't go to the farm because I'm in that population. And so what is happening on a lot of the farms, and like Mike said in the very beginning, a lot of the farms um, in the Chester Agricultural Center was making money in the beginning, but again, there's fearful of that distancing that we continue to have to have, uh, sanitation that we continue to have to have. And so again, as we look at the future, we don't know what the future is going to look like with decrease of people getting infected, getting sick, and what that will play in terms of a lot of our farmers and being able to come to markets and to be able to um, provide, our, provide food for, for the region here. So again, we're trying to take it one day at a time. We continue to uh, 
start seeding, continue to do as much as we can to prepare for this, this upcoming um, cycle. But again, it's a scary situation even on the farm itself with having the social distancing, um, preparing if someone gets sick, what's gonna happen. And so the farmers um, are feeling the pinch uh, as well as the consumers. Thank you, Karen. I, you know, I, when I started working on some of these questions with Alexina and my team, you know, some of the things that came up and I'll just, you know, read some of these to you. And, and, you know, what about protection for volunteers and those, and we talked about this, who distribute few food. And I guess the real question I had was, why aren't we coming up with some sort of, unless we are and I'm missing it, um, some, some sort of standardized uh, method? Is it, is, it, is it too too fast? It's happening too fast, meaning sneeze guards in all the supermarkets and in the pantries, um, you know, so people don't have to have that interaction. Face mask, which again, you know, we get mixed advice, but now the advice is, is that because uh, people are asymptomatic, they, they need them. Um, so food delivery workers, food pantry workers, supermarket workers, um, many of these people, Insta, Insta, uh, car, I mean, all the, this, the whole hey, gamut. Really good point. And I, I'll, I'll respond and I'm happy to share some of this after the call, um, in the form of resources, but I think it's really important to have like a, a time and date stamp on the bottom Yes, because these are changing so often. Right. But I, you know, certainly, um, uh, Chief Service Officer Anusha, um, who we work very, the city works very closely with New York Cares, and I know Joel raised this question on an advocate call we had Friday. Um, we do have standardized guidance for people, for volunteers um, who are wanting to do home deliveries, who are working in kitchens and pantries, or any volunteer um, capacity for that matter. Um, and you know, I think again, echoing Michael here, everybody wants guidance, and so we're issuing all different types of guidance. Um, and today is Tuesday, and that might change by Thursday or Friday. So, you know, from a communication perspective, it's quite challenging to push out information that then, of, of course, is constantly evolving and emerging. Alexina? Can I just ask how the information is being distributed to people? Yeah, um, you know, uh, there's, we're trying to set stand up um, some websites, but also just, you know, sending documents that then can get into the, like, you know, I'm not organizing volunteers, but New York Cares is. So how we can be um, giving them, or Hunger Free America, or Grow NYC, or Rise and Root Farm, right? Ensuring that, you know, again, to, I think, Karen's very important point, you know, how even we're pushing out information and how we're getting people to possibly be able to deliver home to home meals. Um, they're not perfect systems. You know, we, how, whether we're, uh, whether it's the connectivity issues, we've got to just go with what we have and acknowledge that it will always be evolving and getting better. Um, so, you know, and certainly whether it's through this center, you know, we're open to other forums for that. But right now it's pretty classic, like forwarding um, a document um, for distribution and communication um, to others. Because we've been receiving a lot of emails just before this panel, but also questions coming up in the Q&A. Um, New Yorkers want to help, which is one of the beautiful things about New York. So is there a starting point where someone who is healthy and able-bodied can go to, to start looking where volunteers are needed the most? Yeah, let me follow up to specifically after this call with, um, and there's different places, right? Like everyone on this call probably is a, is a throughput to a different volunteer opportunity. Um, and I'll say just personally, like it's, I've had to reconcile and I'm, I'm, I'm there, I'm okay with it. But, of, you know, volunteerism is also sort of an, an essential function, but it's also trying to reconcile that with social isolation, right? Uh, practices and protocols. So, you know, this safe, is, yeah. um, it's just something that's important to, to be mindful of. And I think particularly, you know, this is the marathon. This isn't the sprint here. And there's just going to, you know, whether it's this week or in June, there's going to be um, opportunities for people to plug into in a way that makes sense for them. Um, and that's something that certainly I'll, I'll follow up with you, Alexina, on um, for the portals into those different opportunities. 
Thank you. I also yeah. mentioned Hunger Free America's uh, recruiting volunteers for uh, remote work uh, electronically. And you can go to hungervolunteer.org. That's hungervolunteer.org and sign up. We need people working the phones to help us confirm pantries and kitchens open here and around uh, the country. We have a national hunger hotline and USDA gave us preliminary approval to have some skilled volunteers to help staff that, particularly people who speak English and Spanish would be uh, great. And so you can either go to Hunger Free, uh, either uh, hungervolunteer.org, where anyone can shoot me an email at jberg at hungerfreeamerica.org, except for that racist, anti-Semitic a-hole who was uh, chatting before. But anyone else, send me an email. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. And also, for, for we're not going to duplicate Joel's efforts for the food pantries and so on, because we're going to partner with him. But um, we also have a lot of calls to make for supermarkets and bodegas and things like that. So email info at nycfoodpolicy.org, and uh, we're looking for callers. Uh, to try to upkeep our 59 neighborhoods up to date. Um, and we're excited about that. And again, not to harp on this thing, and I'm going to let it go right after this second, but, um, I, you know, why, I, I guess to me, why aren't there instant policies? Meaning, okay, all supermarkets open have to have the plexiglass to protect their workers. Every worker in a supermarket and a food pantry has to have a mask. I'm, I'm naive like that. And you know that I'm haven't grown up in this, in this world. So, um, One thing I'll just answer, I'll respond to that. You know, it's, it's it, the state, when it comes to grocery stores and supermarkets, the state can make rules, the city can issue guidance and recommendations. Gotcha. Um, so that's just an important awareness to have. Um, you know, the mayor has been very, very vocal on, um, and you know, we're, we've, we've sent out flyers, um, <laughs> 22,000 flyers to all food establishments with, um, you know, uh, guidance on how to social distance. Um, you know, we are fielding, you know, there's all different types of requests out there. Um, but we, you know, we're encouraging all grocery stores to have senior hours. Um, you know, a lot, certainly from our situational awareness and the networks that we have are, of course, already doing that on their own. Um, but just as a point of information in this state, the state makes the rules around grocery stores, um, the city can issue guidance and recommendations. Uh, and, and, and again, that wasn't a question necessarily for the city. That was a question for, yeah. hey, I'm confused, like why New York right. State hasn't done that, not to you specifically. Michael? So I mean, I, if I could jump in for a second. I mean, to Kate's point, uh, the, the guidance around what uh, gloves, masks, what you should wear has changed dramatically from one week to the next. And then there's yes. a, also a real supply issue, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, that I, I have to underscore, we can send out as many guidance and as many points as possible. But um, I mean, I could tell you from just like the HRA universe where we have uh, shelters for folks living with HIV or DV. I mean, we are getting questions about where do we get these items? And there is a supply shortage that I think both the governor and the mayor have discussed that we're trying to address. So guidance alone does, isn't gonna get us there, which is why social distancing is so important. I also wanna say for those of folks who want to volunteer, uh, and I have to put in a plug for my own agency here, help someone fill out an application online so they don't have to come in. We have been able to keep at least one center per borough open to the public. Uh, we want to keep those places as empty as possible. And that is really where New Yorkers can really step up and help their neighbors. Uh, we, we don't want to see you in person. We want to be able to fill, have you fill out your application, get you the resources that you need as quickly as possible. Great. Um, and then, you know, now that there, again, we talked about the layoffs, um, these unprecedented layoffs, uh, we're more than likely in, in um, to going to see an increase in, in people moving from the you know, borderline area to the food insecure and the hungry. Um, should we be worried that there won't be enough uh, volunteers, enough food supply uh, for those that now weren't in need, but are now in need? And if that's true, I know this is all fluid, what are some of the things that we need to prepare for you know, three weeks from now and have we learned anything in the last three weeks? Well, this is all, I, I, I just say that uh, the good thing about the SNAP program, it is an entitlement program. And, and over the decades, we activists have pushed back attempts to block grant it, which would make it not a, 
entitlement program. What that means in plain English for you non-wants listening is that the program by federal law has to expand when the need expands. And so for the zillionth time, I will stress the importance of that, stress the importance of WIC, which is not an entitlement. And WIC has no immigration restrictions on it. And so in New York State, uh, children under five and pregnant women can get that extra uh, benefit and those do expand. I worry most about undocumented immigrants. They're doing the dirtiest jobs, uh, often the most dangerous jobs for the least pay. They're often paid under the table even less than the meager minimum wage. They were excluded from the cash payouts in the stimulus bill. If they have children who are legally here, their children can get SNAP, but they can't. And if they don't have children who are legally here, the family can't legally get any SNAP and doesn't get SNAP. So I think our, our emergency food system and the other giveaways of, of food we're working on really have to focus on on you know, undocumented immigrants in particular. And one other answer about your question about food workers, it's bad enough that uh, we haven't protected, I'm not saying anyone this call, but collectively haven't protected food workers, but the arbitrary definition of who's essential, again, is benefiting the wealthy in society at the sake of, of the low income people. I've had a fight with my own co-op board here in Brooklyn. We do have uh, door people who work in our building and under state law, they're declared essential because they are you know, security. Frankly, I live at the edge of Park Slope. The only threat is someone might throw some kale at us or, or something. <laughs> they're not really security. Uh, let's be frank, we are using them to clean our buildings so us residents are more protected by low income workers. And that's happening throughout the city. So so my unfortunate real answer is, once again, we've prioritized the wealthy and the powerful over the working people. That's excusable to some degree in, in food, just because it is an essential service. And even what you ask if they did it, would the plexiglass be there tomorrow? How would you even you know, do those things? You suggest, I think they should, sneeze guard. But that's a complex, challenging issue for 8,000 stores that accept SNAP. But for non-essential, why we allowed for weeks construction to go on in luxury apartments is, is just unbelievable to me. So a broader question about ill treatment. To kind of piggyback off Joel's point here, um, Plentiful sees about one third of the city's food pantries and services them. We've seen about a 20% drop this month in number of visits across Plentiful. I've also seen a 22% increase in number of new clients with just in the last three weeks over 12,000 clients being registered. A number of self-reservations has doubled. So we're seeing people registering at a pace that's unprecedented for us. City Harvest Mobile Markets has seen a 30% increase in attendance since this started. I wouldn't say this is an impending crisis. I would say this crisis is already currently unfolding. Uh, the numbers we're Why seeing, we, our overall just... visits and our new users should move in the same direction, especially with 34 of our agencies on Plentiful being closed due to COVID. Uh, those numbers should move in the same direction and they're moving in completely opposites, which means we're seeing an influx of new users our senior populations visiting the pantry has dropped by 25 percent our well the rest of the groups maintain a pretty relative average compared to what we've seen the drops uh, i would say this is unfolding a lot quicker and a lot sooner than a lot of other metrics would point out and, and brian just tell uh the audience you know um what plentiful does yeah so plentiful is a piece of software that about 200 food pantries in new york city actively use um, half of those pantries now accept reservations. Um, Plentiful's whole concept is essentially food banks need some data to keep operating and know where to sending food. But the traditional problem with solutions in place has been that it don't benefit the clients visiting the food pantries. Plentiful lets people make reservations at food pantries, receive updates directly from the food pantries in nine languages that are automatically translated by the system. So those clients are always receiving the message in the language of their choice. Um, and with this, it's kind of speaking to the overall inequality is I can go on, I, I, I have a job, I'm employed, I'm thankful enough I've got a job where I can work from home and I can go online and place a fresh direct order and know within two hours when it's gonna be delivered to my house. And you can't find, it's very, very difficult to find up-to-date accurate data on when food pantries are open. And the systems for maintaining those data have traditionally been phone calls. Uh, having a digital platform where if the pantry closes and they say we're closed tomorrow and they delete it from the system, it sends a message to everybody affiliated with that pantry saying, hey, we're closed. We've sent just this month, 790,000 text messages. Our average, at 85% over what we usually see to 94,000 individuals across the city. And those are mostly families. It's this kind of software that's been developed has always been developed for the benefit of 
the food banks and the funders and everything else, but it doesn't reach the end clients. And that level of dignity that we come to expect from being able to get delivery services and scheduled times and knowing things are open on an easy basis doesn't exist for this population. And it really, really should. Is there any talk to um, uh, have um, more delivery services use EBT, uh, SNAP, and, and also um, the other question I would have is, um, you want to uh, answer ask that question about SNAP, Alexina? So if I could just yeah. jump in here uh, for a sec. Uh, so the state has allowed, at least in the city, for EBT cards to be used uh, for delivery uh, with a deal that they had about a, a two years ago, maybe, Joel, uh, with Amazon. Uh, but it right. does go to the point that it's not for like the smaller uh, grocery stores in our neighborhoods that could probably also benefit from being part of that system of delivery, right? But currently today, for, for anyone who has an EBT card, they can't get their groceries delivered uh, through uh, through the uh, relationship that the state has created with Amazon. It's, Grace, it's Amazon, Walmart, and Shoprite, I believe. Access That's right. Ray will give the the three locations, and that those um, were determined um, by USDA. Actually, the city had no choice, um, no decision making authority there with those vendors. That's right. And we have called on Congress to uh, expand authority to uh, all uh, stores that accept SNAP to be able to do that. That would have to happen legislatively. We hope there's a fourth relief bill that includes a lot more money for SNAP, and we hope the fourth release bill also includes that provision, as well as provision to expand the restaurant program, which now exists only in a handful of states for people with disabilities homeless people and and uh, people who are, are seniors to be able to use restaurants in a few states. We think that SNAP at restaurants, we think that should be expanded nationwide uh, overnight, but it would have to happen by Congress as well. Yeah, I just feel like for me, you know, I'm watching this, you know, unfold as, as you all are, and I don't see the, the seniors, the, the, the disabled, the sick, how to make it easy for them to get food delivered to their home. And I, and I, I know these oh, services. I do, need to, I do need to stop you there because the city has yeah. actually transitioned all of its traditional 25,000 meals a day that are distributed through the congregate meal program. Those is that are, the gift at New York City? No, those are, that oh, is get, um, not to be confused with home delivered meals. It is the home delivered, it's a, it's a, all congregate meals are delivered to individuals' homes now. So, and, gotcha. that, you know, within, and that's working well, Kate, week, right? That happened. Um, effective Monday, yesterday, all senior centers um, were congregate meals were delivered um, to individuals' homes. Um, I just want to, you know, it, there's always room to improve. We, I mean, there's also a lot of seniors that we're working to fold into the other um, opportunities that will be announced later this week. Um, but to change these systems, you know, everyone on this phone, to change the Grow NYC market system, to change the way that we do SNAP, to change the way that we feed 25,000 people a day within a week is, um, is, is not insignificant. And yes, we will always improve upon these systems. And I think we are, we're trying to be um, both approach this with a great deal of humility, but also with the need for, you know, always improving on what we're doing. And, and, just and just to underscore uh, what Kate's saying, we are reaching out to our vulnerable populations uh, almost on a daily and weekly basis to understand what their needs are for those that we do know of. The other piece, uh, the outreach is so critical at this point because we don't want any one of these touch points for food to be overstressed, right? So one point that is really an issue in the immigrant population is the, mis the misunderstanding and the confusion around public charge. Before this pandemic, we saw a decrease of around 15% of families with citizen children who are eligible for SNAP leave the rolls because they were nervous that it was going to affect their immigration status. These were folks that were never going to be touched by public charge. So when we look at the immigrant population that could absolutely use SNAP as a resource for food, outreach is so critical. Uh, I also want to say, because I have Commissioner Mustafi in my head, for folks who are confused about that, please reach out to Action NYC. Get the legal advice that you need. You, no one should have to choose a special at a time like this between their potential immigration status and putting food on the, on the table for their children and their families. 
And could someone talk about the Get Food New York City program? Sure. Um, so again, this is a we, we are, we're not publicly announcing any program right now, but we are certainly ideating and soft launching and piloting um, true home delivered meal programs for any New Yorker that needs it. I know the mayor mentioned this on Errol Lewis last night on, on, on Inside City Hall last night. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say that, you know, we, I think on Thursday of last week, we were soft launching this with like 7,000 meals. Yesterday, um, we delivered um, close to 100,000 meals. So really trying to get it, quote, right, so that we don't crash a system, number one, and have people waiting for meals that can never get there. Um, we will be announcing something relatively soon that matches up um, anybody that needs a home delivered meal meeting certain criteria. And I really want to, you know, those criteria are, are not announced yet. This is not something like, you know, show me proof of X, Y, and Z, but we need to ensure and we'll need everybody on this call to help when this is um, uh, formally announced that the home delivered meal really needs to be a last resort because as we know this, there's, you know, hundreds and if not millions of people who are going to need to have home delivered meals um, and this uh, service that the city is looking to to stand up um, is really for those who have no other options um, and so certainly the, the calm strategy behind this is going to be um, a, a really critical to get it right um, but that is absolutely something that we're looking to do is ensuring that anybody in the city that needs a home delivered meal can get that um, and so we'll your have estimates, Kate, of, of the need for that. What do you, what do you, in guesstimate? What, what do you, how many um, people? I, you know, I don't, I, you know, that's the million dollar question. And because if I gave you a number right now, it's going to change in a day. But, you know, we, the indicators, right, that we're looking at is certainly, you know, if you look at COVID positives released from hospitals, if you look at the fact that, you know, Grace is seeing a, a 20,000 people a day register for SNAP, uh, uh, attempt to um, enroll in SNAP. You look at the unemployment insurance um, claim, you know, needs. Um, it's really, really tricky to then also solve for who's living alone, who has family members that can do work for them, uh, you know, uh, attempt to get meals for them. Um, so, you know, it's, it's trying to figure out, are we solving for a demand? Are we going with supply? And um, those are the daily conversations that we're that we're we're trying to stand up. But you know, I appreciate that the mayor certainly um, is giving a tremendous amount of voice and leadership to this space. That we know that people are going to be stuck in their homes, and we need to be able to get them food. Can I just give a plug, a shout out to the unsung heroes, the everyday citizens who are taking care of their neighbors, that are going shopping and asking people in their neighborhoods, on their block, in their building. If there are scenes, what do they need so that they go shopping for the seniors or the underserved? So I want to give a shout out because within my community, that's what people are doing. Young people are going door to door, asking seniors, what do they need? And I think as New Yorkers, we have to somehow get together that if you go shopping, you're asking your neighbor who's home alone. You're asking someone who's disabled, what do you need from the store? I will get it for you. And so it's not only, you know, concentrating on city agency and government to help. But we as people and individuals need to take it upon ourselves to ask our neighbors if they're in need of food, what can we do? Some people are even cooking large meals so that they can serve the people in their community because they know relying on government is not going to do it. So what people are doing within my community, and I know communities like mine, are asking what is it that we can do? We are, again, going to the store for people, cooking more meals for people, because at the end of the day, we know we're the low people on the, on the totem pole. But this takes a, an effort from all New Yorkers and all people within this country to step forward and ask those hard questions. How can we help and how can we make a difference? I'd be, I'd be remiss here and I'm being, I want to remind everybody, like, and especially on this call, like everybody here has a channel through which they need volunteers, including City Harvest. Uh, the mobile markets are still operating. They're still delivering food day in, day out throughout the city. You can help your neighbors directly, but if you're not comfortable, don't want to do that, you want to volunteer in a group, uh, more of a formal capacity, there's tons of volunteer opportunities throughout the city. These food programs are still happening on a daily basis. They're still out there and people, they need volunteers more than ever. So what can we Michael, do? How can we support uh, farmers markets more, better? What can we do? I think it's knowing that we're open and coming out and supporting your farmers. 
like Karen said, have one shopper for your building, go out and, and, and do it all. We are going to continue to uh, look at our models and see what other, what we can put into, a, into place to facilitate drop offs at individual buildings. I think those are the conversations we're having now with the city and, and, and with the philanthropic community. The point is this, we learned after Sandy, we had the same conversations after Sandy about community resilience and investing in people on the ground. And there are kitchens everywhere. There are groups out there like Fig, like Make the Road, who are feeding their neighbors right now and, and getting those on the ground folks resources so that when we're not in a pandemic, they're, they're capable to, to, to respond and to see them as first responders is, is vital. Um, and then we can, and then there are folks like us who can get food to them and uh, use our structure and our infrastructure to get the food everywhere. But markets are open, food boxes are open, our farm sites, our, our farm stands are open. Um, there's, we are making it as safe as possible for you to shop there. Um, and and it, they're vital for, for our farmer community. And it is the alternative food economy. Well, I want to thank, I want to, I'd like to try to end right on time at 1030. Um, we didn't have time for a lot of questions, um, but I think we covered a lot of material and I, you know, I want to thank you all for coming today um, and taking time out of your schedules. I know we have so many, all of you have so many things going on. Um, and again, check uh, all of your different websites and also nycfoodpolicy.org uh, for updates and information on uh, food resources. And um, I want to thank you again and hopefully we can we can do this again in uh, you know 45 days and, and and see where we are. Maybe there are some lessons learned that we can that will you know change our lives forever. So thank you very much. I just thank want to chime in. We had a lot a lot of questions come in, and we're going to do our best to answer them directly to everyone after, and maybe reach out to panelists if we need to. And uh, this is a new platform for us, so apologies for the troll, we can control it, but we'll try to shut that down a lot faster. And I know that was very offensive. I just want to acknowledge that we do not yeah. control that. So I was fumbling to shut that down as quickly as possible. Yeah. About the troll, we so often talk about it. Sorry, Karen. What's that? What's that, Michael? I was gonna say, we so often talk about the subtle racism of food system. And today we got to see the glaring- First hand, yeah. That it is this group and it is our community that is much stronger than these trolls out there. And uh, it's what is going to take us to get through this together because it's, it's all, it's, it's, we haven't seen the tip of it yet. That's so right. We are all, all right. of us, be all of the above. It's going to allow us to get through this working together and just, and, and seeing ourselves as a large, even global community. Thank and you. thank you. Thank you everyone on this panel and everybody out there that's listening for all that you do, because you're the, what makes this city a great city, and, and we thank everybody. So before I cry, I'm gonna end the, end the meeting. Onward. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.